Amen. Yeah, go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, United. If you guys don't have a Bible already, if you didn't grab a handout, there is a table with handouts, pens, Bibles on that back table. Would love for you guys to grab one so that you can follow along as we turn to passages this morning, so that you can take notes as we talk through what we're about to talk through. And and, and you guys probably notice already, I'm not the guy, I'm not the usual guy that's up here on the weekend. If somehow we have not met yet, my name is Jacob, uh, just one of the small group leaders here. And uh, it's been my privilege to be a small group leader here at the United going on about uh, seven years now. It's been seven years. I've had the privilege of of studying, of being here with you guys week in, week out, leading a small group, all of that fun stuff. It certainly has been a privilege. But yeah, not the, not the guy that's normally up here. Uh, no, I don't work here. My, my job actually, my, my regular job, what I'm doing throughout the week is uh, I'm actually a mechanical engineer. Um, that's what I went to school for. That's what I get to do on a regular basis. And I know when I say that, some of the fellow uh, small group leaders, they always chuckle because I, I work in sales. So, so I, I work in sales. I get to marry that with the, uh, with the engineering background that I have. I really enjoy my job and, and what I get to do, but it is much more a privilege to, uh, to, to be with you guys here this morning and to open up God's Word together. And, uh, you know, ever since I was in high school, probably even before I was in high school, certainly while I was in high school, and ever since, I, I've heard this idea echoed and repeated time and time again. And it's this idea that, man, high school, it doesn't, it doesn't really prepare you for the real world. I mean, what are we doing at high school, right? I, I mean, I hear it all the time in conversations. I, I see it in posts on Instagram. Uh, even on LinkedIn this past week, I saw something similar, right? The business profession professional social media that that is still people talking about how high school is it even really preparing us and you know it's like man covalent bonds what i, I mean writing sonnets i i don't know solving for x come on when are we ever going to use this stuff right i hear that that idea echoed time and time again and and, and while i could stand here and while we could maybe debate the merits of some of those courses that you guys have to take if they're really worthwhile how they'll apply to your future if they'll apply to your future at some uh, at some point some of the topics that you guys discuss, I mean, uh, questionable at best at times. And uh, yeah, while we could stand here, I could debate with you guys, we could talk about if those things are worthwhile. I bring this up because I really hope that our time together here this morning, this Sunday morning, and each time that we gather together as the church, that we don't think of what we do here in this ministry or here at this church as we open the word in that same way, that we don't think, oh man, yeah, just another weekend at church, when am I ever going to really use that? It's not really applying to my life. No, on the contrary, it is my hope, it is my prayer that as we gather together, our thought instead is, man, as soon as I leave these doors, as soon as I walk out, I am ready to apply what God's word says into my life so that I can be obedient in it this afternoon, so that I can be obedient in it throughout this week, and so that I can be obedient to what God's word says till the day that I die or Jesus Christ returns. I hope that we don't have that same attitude of when will I ever use this about what we do here together. I trust that many of you guys now know the words of 2 Timothy 3.16 well. It's something that we talk about a lot here in this ministry, right, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Amen? Yeah. All scripture profitable for teaching. And that idea is that it's even profitable to be applied to your guys' lives. So with that being said, let's turn on over to 1 Thessalonians 4 to our passage for this morning. I'm excited to dive into it with you guys. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4 is what we are going to be looking at in this, this message, this passage. It is to prepare you. It is to prepare you for life. It is to prepare you for Sunday afternoon. It is to prepare you for Monday morning. And uh, so it is my prayer that we would do just that. You guys there with me in 1 Thessalonians 4? Let's look at verse 9. Verse 9 is where we are going to start, and we're going to read on down to the end of that paragraph. First, that's 4, verse 9. Now, 
Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And maybe right off the bat as we read that passage and and you're thinking what we've been studying here as a ministry, what we're even just talking about this past weekend, and hopefully if you guys were here uh, this last Thursday at small groups, you're tracking, okay, well, this last weekend we were talking about love, loving one another, love God, all that stuff. We were talking about the great commandment. Okay, here we're talking about love again, right? Okay, cool. How do these things, it seems like there's a, a coherent, a cohesive flow of thought. That's cool, right? And you guys were here, the great commandment. You guys remember what we were studying last week? You guys remember what it was, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second commandment, right? It's like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? And okay, so here we are. We're coming to this passage, and uh, we're seeing verse 9. Okay, we're talking about brotherly love. Okay, yeah, yeah, and that's exactly where we're going to start this morning. That's exactly what I want to start looking at with you all here this morning, is this idea of love and really diving in, in particular, to this word, that we get translated as brotherly love here in 1 Thess 4, verse 9. And if you guys study the Bible, if you guys take the time and you guys really want to study Scripture and study the original languages that the Bible was written in and the Greek that's used in the New Testament, one of the things that you'll learn is there's four types of love. There's actually four different Greek words that all get translated to love in the English language, and the one that's used here is this word Philadelphia. And if you guys have been around the church, you've probably heard that before. Maybe that's not super surprising to you, but the word Philadelphia, right? Or maybe you think of the, the city in, uh, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love, right? Maybe that comes to your, it comes to your mind. That, that city's even named after this idea, this word, Philadelphia. And Philadelphia... The purpose of Philadelphia, the definition of Philadelphia, the reason why that one would be used is specifically to describe a brotherly or a sisterly love, a sibling love that that the writer here, that Paul is going to talk about. So Philadelphia, this idea of brotherly love, of sibling love. And you guys might be surprised to hear, actually this very week, I will be traveling to Pennsylvania. I'll be traveling to Pennsylvania to go and visit my little brother and my little sister. Maybe some of you guys didn't know that I had two little siblings. I got a little brother. He's actually just graduated college. I'll be flying out this week to go see his graduation there in Pennsylvania. And uh, not only do I have a little brother who just graduated college, I also have a little sister, little sister who's a junior in high school, just like some of you guys here. If they were here in California, it would be my prayer that they would, that she would be sitting here. Sophia would be with us here even this morning, Uh, but they're over in Philadelphia, actually not Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, but in Pennsylvania. And, uh, And so I got a little brother, I got a little sister, I love both of them. And this word Philadelphia would be used to describe that sort of sibling love that, that we would expect to have for a brother or for a sister. And, and prior to Christ, and prior to the planting of the churches, as the apostles go out and plant churches, this word Philadelphia really was never used outside of that context. It was never really used to describe anything but a love that you would have for somebody related to you by blood, your actual sibling. Right, And then as Christianity comes in and starts to spread, well, this word is kind of like adopted by the apostles to describe now the relationship that we have with one another, this brotherly love or this sisterly love that we have for one another in Christianity. It's something that speaks to a closeness. And now, now no longer just a, a blood sort of relationship because we got the same mom, the same dad sort of thing, but now because we have shared in the blood of Christ, we are now recognized as brothers and sisters in 
love. And I just want to make sure as we're studying this word Philadelphia and as we're talking about love that we have a clear understanding of what this love, what Philadelphia really looks like. Because the Thessalonians, they're commended here, right? I mean, did you catch that? They're commended. Paul's saying, hey, about Philadelphia, about this type of sibling love for other Christians, you guys don't even need anybody to write to you about it. You guys are crushing it, right? Paul is commending them for this. So I want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what Philadelphia is. And as I was studying this word and studying it throughout the New Testament, seeing how it was used, I began to see this theme popping up each time brotherly love was used. And and this idea of brotherly love was often paired with this other idea. And we see it here in 1 Thessalonians 4. We see we're talking about brotherly love. And then at, at the end of verse 10, we get this idea of more and more, right? Paul, Paul tells them, hey, brotherly love isn't something that you just, uh, you just, all right, you got it, you check the box, you're done, you can say you love one another, but no, it's something that we are called to excel in, to grow in. Even the idea when he says more and more is the idea that, hey, there's some expected level, there's some baseline level that, that we all might think is an okay amount or a reasonable amount of love that we would have for one another. When, when Paul says more and more, the picture is that that cup is now overflowing. Like we're still at the soda machine filling it up and it is spilling over because we want to do so more and more, well beyond what would be expected of us, but uh, continuing. And in Romans, Paul gives a similar idea. He, He connects these two thoughts there as well. If you want to turn there with me to Romans 12, I want to show you this uh, there in Romans 12, because Paul In Romans 12, he talks about brotherly love, sisterly love, as if it's like a competition, as if it's something that me and you are fighting in, racing in, trying to edge one another out in. In Romans 12, verse 10, Paul, he's going to give a very similar, a very similar command. He says, love one another with Philadelphia. Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly love. And then what Paul says is he says, outdo one another in showing honor. Right there, he's calling us to outdo. Like, like yeah, we want to love the person next to us, but guess what? We're also like in a competition with one another because I'm trying to do it more than the person next to me. I'm not going to settle with this. This is how much I've been loved, and so therefore that's how I'm going to return the favor. No, the idea is that we want to outdo one another in showing love like it is a competition. And this idea that Paul continues on in Right When he says in verse 10, in showing honor, the idea there is preferring one another, like placing one another, placing the people sitting right next to you maybe here this morning, placing them above yourself. Even the idea of this word that gets translated preferring or this, this word that gets translated showing honor is this idea of like leading the way. And when I think of leading the way, I think of going on hikes. I I used to love going on hikes. I still love going on hikes. I don't get to go on as many hikes as as I once did. Um, Anybody here like going on on a nice hike? Yeah, yeah, good. Good. Outdoors are beautiful. I love it. Well, in college, in college, uh, I used to go on a bunch of hikes. When I had free time, me and my buddy Lucas, we would uh, hop in the car. We'd go for a drive, and as we were driving, we'd be looking out the windows. We went to, we went to college in a pretty uh, mountainous area, hilly region, and so we'd be driving, and we'd, we'd just be like, oh, let's go for that one, and we'd just pick some random spot, some hike that we wanted to do, no trail, no, no pre-described path for us to go on. We would just decide, all right, let's try and get to the top of that one today. We don't know how long it'll take us. We don't know what that, that's going to look like, but that's, that's our activity for the day. So I'd pull off the road, and uh, we, we just start going for it. And man, the number of times that I came back like with some real issues because of this was, was frequent, uh, almost every time. I mean, because I would literally be crawling on hands and knees. I remember this one time, hands and 
and knees, crawling under these tiny bushes because there was physically no other way to get around. They were taller than my head, and they went all the way down to the ground, and so we're crawling on all fours. I got poison ivy or poison oak from that one, Um, but it was something that we would do all the time, and I loved it, and what would happen as we were going on these hikes so often, because there was no path for us to follow, there was no actual trail for us to go on, what would happen is the person in front, right, the person in front is often like holding back the brush, holding back the, the woods, the, the thistles and the branches that are covering this direction that we're trying to head in, right? And so the person in front is leading the way, and they're often just taking strays to the face as they're pushing back branches, right, and getting hit with them as they're going, right? Why? So that the person behind them, so that the person behind them could just like walk through casually, right? Not even realizing that there's no path that we're following, Right? And, and that's the idea that Paul is painting here when he's talking about showing honor or preferring the other person. It's that we're leading the way. Like for one another here in this room, we're called to, in a loving way, lead the way, be willing and ready to take the strays to the face, to take the damage on ourselves so that our brother, so that our sister behind us can walk the path clearly. Elsewhere, Peter, and you don't have to turn there with me, but Peter, he catches on to this theme when he's writing his letter in 1 Peter, uh, that that brotherly love isn't a simple check-the-box sort of thing, but it's an all-out race to the bottom. In 1 Peter 1, 22, Peter says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Philadelphia, love one another, he commands, earnestly from a pure heart. So once again, now Peter, he's connecting these ideas of brotherly love being something that that is paired with this earnestness, this this strain, right? Like this, this, ah, it's it's what I want. It's what I'm trying to get. It's like, ah, I just, I can't reach it. Like I'm reaching out my arm. I'm doing everything that I can to get this. I just want to reach it or like, ah, like if I could just get the last Pringle in this tube, like straining every finger in my fat, tiny little hands so that I could get the, ah, like the last one, like everything that I can't, right? Like that's the idea that there would be a real, a real strain towards this brotherly love, towards this Philadelphia that you and I would have for the one and others here in this room. That it wouldn't just be this, ah, you know, uh, I, yeah, well, when I'm here on the weekend, when I'm here on a Sunday, on a Thursday, whatever it is, like, yeah, I love my one another's because when I show up, I, I dap them up. I say, hey, what's going on? Hey, I ask them how their week was doing. I, I ask what's going on in their life. You know, we're friendly. Maybe every once in a while when my small group leader plans it, we hang out or maybe we'll go grab dinner after a service or that sort of thing. We'll go grab lunch after, after the 11. And yeah, we're really, we're really tight. We're really bros. We're really sisters. We really love one another because of those sort of things. And uh, that, that's not the brotherly love. That's not the picture that Paul, and that's not the picture that Scripture is going to paint for us of this brotherly love. So you can put it down to point number one, brotherly love costs. There is a real strain, there is a real pain, there is a real effort and energy that must be associated with a true and sincere brotherly love. If you're a lady, feel free to write down sisterly love. That, that idea of Philadelphia is the same, and it is sibling love. So brotherly love, sisterly love, it costs. There's a real, there is a real taxing aspect to it, where it takes something from you. See, Paul, he could command this himself because he did this himself. Paul, he was not the I'm just going to cruise kind of guy. No, Paul, like when he would go on a missionary journey, so Paul, he, he goes to Thessalonica to plant this church. He writes this letter like a year, barely over a year after Paul had gone and visited the church. But while Paul's there, while he's on this missionary journey, he's not like on some missions trip that's like, oh, it's a fun, relaxing vacation. It'll be so nice. It'll be nice to be unplugged for a little bit, you know. And oh, there's going to be this nice aspect of it too where it's like, oh, cool, there'll be a really good purpose to it. I'm going to share the gospel with some people. It'll be relaxing, but it'll also be fun, and it'll be it'll be this good, and I'll get to preach the gospel, and we'll all have a good time, and it's just going to be like a, a 
cool, fun vacation mixed with some, some sharing the gospel. Well, turn back to 1 Thessalonians because I, I just want to make it really clear that this is not what, what Paul exemplified to the people when he came in to plant this church. That is not at all how Paul would act when he was going on these missionary journeys. Quite the opposite. If you went back to 1 Thessalonians with me, turn an extra page to the left to 1 Thessalonians 2 where we're going to see exactly what Paul would do while he was there with the Thessalonians. Because Paul, Paul, he really put in his work. He, he was not there just chilling, just cruising, just preaching the gospel every once in a while. No, quite the opposite. First Thessalonians 2, let's look at verse 9. Paul says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. See, see, Paul, he's showing us not only what it looks like to excel, which he certainly does, right? We get that clear picture. Paul, he's talking about labor and toil. When you read that passage, you get a very clear picture that while Paul is in Thessalonica, he's not just chilling with the other Thessalonians. No, not at all. We get a picture of what this excelling, what this straining, what this more and more kind of attitude really looks like. But not only do we get that, do we get that picture of, okay, there's a real effort and there's a real cost. We get some real specifics on what brotherly and sister love looks like, right? We get some specifics, not just it's easy for me to stand up here and tell you guys, hey, you need to go love one another, love your brothers, love your sisters, great, go and do it. Well, what's so awesome about this passage is we get the specifics of how Paul loved the Thessalonians. Let's look at it again, breaking it down slower. Labor and, and toil, Okay, he's working hard night and day in this. And, and what is he doing? Well, first, he, he's willing and he's ready to proclaim the truth, to preach the gospel, right? He's there, he's there even with believers, and he's ready, he is willing to preach the gospel, to share truth with the one another's there in that church. Not only that, but he's ready to set for them an example of obedience, right? Paul, Paul makes the point that, hey, when we were with you, we were holy, righteous, and blameless in our conduct towards you. There is a real fruitfulness. There is a real love that is had, seen, and experienced as you guys individually are pursuing obedience, are, are pursuing holiness and righteousness in your own lives. Man, as I think about my own life and my own fellowship group, there are few things more encouraging than looking to my left and looking to my right and seeing brothers who they in themselves are taking very seriously the commands of Christ. So one way that Paul, he, he's loved in the Thessalonians, he's setting that example of brotherly love as he's preaching them the truth. The other way that he's doing it is he, he himself is committed to obedience to Christ. He himself is committed to holiness and righteousness. Not only that, Paul, he, he's ready to talk with them. He's ready to get into the weeds of these people's lives, right? Do you see what, uh, do you see what he says there? In verse 12, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you, and charged you, right? Paul, he's using his lips. He's actually talking with one another, and not just in a way of like, oh, hey, like, what'd you do this weekend, right? But, but he's getting to know these people so that he can spur them on in the right direction, so that he can help them be obedient, so that he can encourage them in their struggles and what's going on, and so that he can charge them with the truth of what scripture says, so that he can charge them in how to go be obedient. He sees where maybe they're falling short or where maybe they're struggling to obey, and he's ready to charge them to press on in obedience, See, so if we go back to chapter 4 and we think about then this idea when Paul tells them to do this more and more, and again, we remind ourselves that this, this more and more type of love that Paul's commanding them to isn't a I'm okay with some fixed amount, 
right? Because maybe when you walk through these doors, there is a fixed amount of love that's expected, right? Hey, we're, we're the church. And I would like to commend you guys. I, I love seeing how you guys have grown in love, not just over the past four years as I've seen my, my senior small group grow from freshmen to sophomores to juniors to seniors, but even over the last seven years that I've been involved in this ministry, it's so awesome to see how you all have grown in loving one another. But the idea is that we would not be okay with some fixed amount of love that's expected of us when we walk into these doors, but that we would continue to excel, to blow past what would be expected of us in love, in an effort to do so more and more. The scripture, the scripture is telling us to stop thinking the way of I'm just going to go with the flow and do what's expected when it comes to loving our brothers and our sisters here in this room. And as I was studying this passage, as I was studying 1 Thessalonians 4, getting ready to preach, I was tracking with all this, and I, and I loved the connection between uh, love that we were talking about last week in the Great Commandment and here, how we get into brotherly love and this idea to excel in it and to keep growing in it. But then where we go from there uh, was honestly a little surprising. It was maybe two ideas that I, that, that I think not many of us think about frequently coming together. Let's look back at what Paul says. Let, let's see, because Paul, he gives this as a charge, this idea of brotherly love and excelling more and more. He gives this as a charge for what he says next. Start with me like halfway into verse 10 at, but we urge. First Thessalonians 4 verse 10, but we urge you, brothers, we want to push you in this direction, church, to do this more and more, excel in it, and, okay, to aspire, have lofty goals for what? To live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. See, what Paul does here in this passage is he connects this idea of Philadelphia, he connects this idea of the love that you and I are commanded to have for our one another's, and he connects this idea with how we work, how we live, and how we go about our day-to-day -day lives when none of these people are even next to you, when none of these people are maybe even in the same room as you, where they're miles away from you. Paul, he begins to connect these two ideas of Philadelphia and love, and you on your own, in your work, in your diligence, at your school, while you're at home, all of those areas. And I wonder how much of us, how many of us have really, uh, really connected these two things before. See, I think so often we don't connect those things. We don't think that the, the way we live when nobody's around us connects with how we love when we are around our one another's. And what does Paul say? He says, I want to urge you, I want to press you on in this right direction of loving one another by living quietly, minding your own business, and working hard. See, so often we think about things like schoolwork as, ah, well, well schoolwork, that's just, that's just my own grade. That's just uh, how well I'm going to do in this class. That's just, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, what school I'm going to go to after. Maybe, maybe that'll impact, like, what career I have in the future. But schoolwork, that, that really just impacts me. Or maybe even, like, your chores, the things you got to do at home. You think, oh, those are just my duties. That's just my checklist. Those are just, you know, my responsibilities at home. Those have no bearing on the other people here in this room. Or maybe you got a part-time job. Maybe, maybe you're one of those guys, gals, that have a part-time job, and you actually get to, to earn some money, and you think, yeah, this is my money, my part-time job, and how I work at my part-time job, whether or not I get a part-time job, those are really just things that affect me. And if I have money to spend on, on food or on new clothes or whatever it is that I want, maybe even getting your license, right? Maybe something like, like being diligent to get your license on time. Maybe that's something that you just have thought in the way of, uh, well, that just really impacts whether or not I can get around, whether or not I, if I need a ride somewhere, or if my parents got to take me, or if I can make it somewhere. You know, th these are all just things that impact myself. And what I want us to see, 
and what Scripture is teaching us to think here is that a love for our brothers and sisters will change the way that we think about diligence in all of those areas of our own lives. You can get it down for point number two like this. Work to love others. Work to love others others. And when I say work to love others, it's not just a rephrasing of point number one saying that, hey, loving one another is really going to take work. It's really going to be costly because if we're doing it in the way scripture commands us, it's going to have a real weight to it, a strain to it, a pain to it. No, no, uh, what I mean by work to love others, I, I mean the way that you work be it schoolwork, be it housework, be it actual part-time job work, whatever it is, that very thing can be done to love others. And we're going to jump real quick into A, because Paul, he's going he's to break this into two categories here for the Thessalonians. He, he's going to break it into two categories. And the first category that he wants to bring up to the Thessalonians with how they love will be impacted by how they work is your work and the church. Your work and the church for point A. Your work and the church. And Paul, he already gave us this example, right? I mean, we looked at chapter two together, and we saw that Paul, he labored and he toiled, that it was a night and a day type of thing. He saw that his work was a way to love the Thessalonians. And maybe when you read that, you think, well, yeah, his work, like, like to be there as an evangelist, as somebody who's working as a missionary, right, like to plant churches. Uh, no, that's not what Paul means. What Paul means when he's talking about how he labored and toiled, how he worked night and day, he's talking about his actual job. Did, did you guys know that Paul was a tent maker? Like that was his actual profession, like that was the way that he earned his own money was he was manufacturing tents for people to live in and sleep in. Like that was Paul's full-time job. That, that's what he was doing while he was here in Thessalonica. He was literally working like a full-time job, night and day, manufacturing tents for people. And he's saying that he was doing that specifically for the purpose of showing love to the people there at that church. He did this so that he could earn his own money so that he would be dependent on nobody at that church while he was there. He didn't want to be a burden on anybody that was there at that church. And then he didn't want to just stop there, but he wanted to be working and earning his own money so that he would be ready, willing, able to give to those that were in need at the Thessalonian church. He was ready to support others. And so I got to ask you all, is this how you think about the work that you have to do? Is this how you think about the the part-time job? Is this how you think about the schoolwork? Is this how you think about studying to get your permit on time? Whatever it is, is this how you think about the work that you have been commanded, that you have been tasked with doing? See, I, I hear complaints all the time, all around both, both at church and outside of church, in my job with other people that I work with, people at other companies, all that. I hear it all the time, and it is complaints about how much people don't want to work, right? Oh, yes, it's Friday, finally. Two days to myself, no work. I can't wait for it, right? Oh, yeah, you know, just another day of work. Oh, Happy Monday, you know, as is said sarcastically. So often I hear people talking and complaining about how much they have to work, how they have to work, just really even the fact that they have to work. And uh, I don't know if you guys realize this. I don't know if you guys have thought that way about like schoolwork before, but uh, I don't know if you guys realize this, but Adam, right? You go back to Adam with me. Work is not a result of sin, We don't have to have jobs. We don't have to work because, ah, Adam, he ate the fruit. Eve ate the fruit, gave it to Adam. All that happened. Fast forward a couple years, and here we are. We got to work hard. What a bummer. That's why it sucks. No, not at all. Did you guys know that in Genesis 2, it tells us that God created Adam specifically for the purpose so that Adam would be able to work God's creation? Like, Adam is put before sin in the garden so that he could work. That was his purpose. Work, it's not a result of sin. No, work has been around from the beginning before sin. 
Ecclesiastes 2 even tells us that we were not just made to work, but we were made to find enjoyment in our work. Ecclesiastes 3 goes on with, the, with that idea and tells us that it is a gift from the Lord that we are able to enjoy our work that we must do. There is a real enjoyment to it. And see, most people, maybe you guys even thinking about schoolwork, you think, uh, when you think about work, it's like, ah, it's just something that I got to do. Like, here I am, I'm in high school, it's just what I have to do. I'm going to trudge along in it so that I can get this grade. And my part-time job, I'm just going to press through this shift so that, uh, you know, I can earn some money because I like money, I need money, I need money to live, got to have that. And, and so I'm just going to press on in this. But that, that is not at all how Scripture has taught us to think. No, quite the opposite. The way that Scripture teaches us to think is that we ought to work diligently, and as we work diligently, God himself will supply all of our needs. And if you haven't thought that way before, or even if you have, let's turn back on over to Proverbs 10, right near the middle of your Bible, Psalms, then Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10. And I, wanna, uh, I think this verse makes it super clear. I think it's really helpful. And I want to make sure that we all have a right understanding of this. Because as we're thinking about these, these things, as we're thinking about our work and we're thinking about, yeah, right now I have school work and okay, I gotta, maybe I got to start thinking rightly about that. And I'm going to say work probably another 100,000 times as we're here together. The idea is that you need to start thinking right about your work that you have to do now, your school work, your homework, how you uh, spend your time, all of those things in this right way so that one day when you do have your career, when you do have your job, whatever it is, it is that you're doing that you would think rightly in that time as well. So Proverbs 10, start with me in verse 3. King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, he wants to tell his son something about work. And in Proverbs 10, 3, he says, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand, a lazy hand, a lazy person causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. See, what this passage is teaching us is that God himself is responsible for supplying the needs of the righteous. See, this is a promise here, that if you live righteously, that if you set your mind on things above, Right? If you seek first the kingdom, then all these things, they will be added to you. That's the idea. And I think so many of us don't think this way. And so much of our culture is so separated from this way of thinking. I hear so often this idea that, oh man, uh, money's tight, so I got I to gotta keep working harder. I got to put off these responsibilities. I'm not going to be faithful in these other things that I'm called to do. I, I, gotta, I can't make it to church this week, or I'm not going to do this thing or that thing that I know I'm called to do because, man, money's tight, and I just got to keep working hard. I got to do more. Like, I'm responsible for supplying my needs and making whatever it is happen for myself, and so that's going to be number one priority because if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And what scripture teaches us is that that is simply not the way it is, that it is God himself who will supply. See, the, work, the result of hard work is provision from the Lord. The result of hard work in your class is provision from the Lord. It's not just a good grade from your teacher. That's not coming from your teacher. That is a gift from the Lord when you work diligently and you are rewarded. Uh, your paycheck that's coming, it's not coming from in and out. It's coming because you are working diligently for the Lord. He is supplying for your needs, and, and that's what God has always promised to do. It's not because California has some minimum wage and therefore that's, that's what's, getting, uh, what's getting you by. No, quite the opposite. It is the Lord himself who is providing. And I think as we see the, this idea come together, as we see the idea that, that the result of diligent work is a gift from the Lord, well then, going back to brotherly love, going back to sisterly love, well those ideas, they start to make sense together because we realize, well wait, those things aren't ours to begin with. I didn't earn it. It's not mine. That is a gift from 
the Lord, it is something that the Lord has provided for me. And I want to show you this. This idea is repeated re- repeatedly throughout Proverbs. You don't have to turn with me, but I'm going, to, I'm going to breeze us through a handful of Proverbs that are going to give us this same idea. Feel free to jot it down. You can look at them later. But Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 tells us to honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits, the best of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty. Well, what that passage is telling us is that the first that you get, the best that you get, give that to the Lord, and he will make sure that all your needs are met, that your barns continue to be filled. So often, the way that we think is, oh, the first that I get, well, I don't know if any more is coming. I don't, I don't know if anything else is going to happen, right? We're talking about like growing crops here in this time. And it's like, well, the first fruits, the first gathering of all of our grapes or all of our corn or all of our olives, whatever it is that we're gathering, right? Well, well what if something happens? And what if no more fruit is produced this whole season, right? Well, well I got to keep the first fruits for myself. Well, what, what the Lord is telling us in his word is that, no, no, no. Give the first fruits to the Lord. Give the best of what you have to the Lord, and he will make sure that your barns will be filled with plenty. Proverbs 11.24 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. That's Proverbs 11.24. The one who is generous and ready to give to those who need Yeah, the Lord will continue to bless that person and see them grow richer still. Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 31, if you've been around for a minute, ladies, and and you've been here for the ladies' nights that we've been having, um, you've heard teaching from Haley throughout Proverbs 31. And what Proverbs 31 teaches is that the woman who fears the Lord while she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Not only that, but she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. It says that she looks well to the way of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness, the bread of laziness. See, it doesn't matter what occupation you have in the future, whether you're somebody working at a corporation making millions, whether you're cleaning toilets, whether you're staying at home working for your family, whether you're out and about, it doesn't matter if you're here and you have school, it doesn't matter if you have a part-time job, it doesn't matter what the responsibility is that's laid on your plate, the Lord tells us that if we are diligent to approach those things in obedience with the way that he has called us to do it, that he will supply all of our needs. And the reality is this is what the Thessalonian church was known for, right? When it says back in our passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 that uh, they were known for their love for the churches throughout all of Macedonia, right? The picture here is here's Thessalonica on the coast. They're a coastal town, right? A small little town. You could really think of like Huntington Beach. They were on the water. They were a hub of like commerce and trade. There's a lot of politics going on in the area. It was a fairly wealthy area. That's Thessalonica. And then Macedonia, the whole area surrounding them, like Southern California, maybe as a whole for us. See, this little church in Thessalonica, they were known for their support, for their love of the churches in the entire area. And specifically what that's even talking about is that they were financially involved in the support of anyone that they could reach in that whole area. All the Macedonians, they knew the church at Thessalonica because they were going out of their way. They were looking for opportunities to be generous. And that doesn't just come because it's like, oh, they, you know, just found a bunch of money somewhere. No, they were diligent in their work and they approached their own work in their own lives in a way that allowed them and prepared them to be ready to give to whoever they could reach. And I know what you're thinking at this point. Okay, work, earning money, supporting other churches. That's all cool, but, but Jacob, I am a broke high school student. 
Maybe, maybe you're thinking, I cannot even legally have a part-time job yet, and uh, I don't have any money. I've been saving up my birthday money, but you know that I don't know that that's really cutting it for the type of thing that you're talking about here. I'm a broke high school student, a poor high school student. Man, how does this apply to me? Well, I have kind of three quick thoughts for you as you were thinking maybe about that idea of, uh, of hey, how does this apply to me? And the first thought I have for you guys um, is that the commands to generosity throughout Scripture, they're not given in amount. They're not given in amount, but they are given in attitude. If you guys know 2 Corinthians 9, you know that that passage, it doesn't tell us that God loves a lavish or an extravagant giver, a bountiful giver, one who's giving just tons and tons of money in time. No, no, 2 Corinthians 9 doesn't tell us that God loves a lavish giver. It tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. God is pleased with the attitude and the intent in your heart with how you handle what you have. So just because you're a broke high school student doesn't mean that you can't partake in this idea of of giving. Because the reality is that supporting the brothers and sisters in need is a command, right? We are told that we ought to do that. We ought to be ready to do that very thing for the one and others. And not just for that, but for the church itself. See, I don't know how many of you guys have, have realized this, but this church as a whole, does not exist without this happening, right? Like trolley coffee isn't cutting it. It's not paying the bills for for this building and that building, for the rent, for the lights, for the cereal that we get to have together. No, trolley coffee isn't some profit center supporting this whole church. The reason that this church exists today in the capacity that it does, the reason that you all have chairs to sit in is because there are faithful men and women sitting in main service right now who have committed to giving, who have committed to working hard in their own jobs so that they can give to support the needs of the church, the growth of the church and the advancement of the gospel here in Huntington Beach, right? And so that right mindset with how you could be thinking about your work today will impact 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now. Maybe your diligence in work now will really come to pay off when you are able to be a cheerful giver with the goal, with the attitude that, hey, I want to use all that God has given me for his glory. And I'm just going to be faithful to do that with whatever God has given me. And I can promise you, as scripture promises you, that if you are faithful to do what he's called you to do, he will be faithful to continue to fill your barns with plenty. Because you all have barns, right? Good. (laughs) Second thought that I had is uh, even those who are poor, even desperately so, they can still give, right? Yeah, maybe you guys are a bunch of broke high school students without a bunch of money. Uh, This isn't exactly the top 1% here in, in, uh, in Huntington Beach. I get that. Right, But even those who are poor and desperately so, they can still give. See, the Macedonians, all those in that area around Thessalonica, who, the- who the Thessalonians are commended for giving to and supporting, in 2 Corinthians 8, you ready for this? You ready for how Scripture describes these people? In 2 Corinthians 8, it describes the people of Macedonia as extremely impoverished. Like, ouch, like, like they are scraping the bottom of the barrel. They don't have the, knee, the, the basic, the, the bare minimum to live on is the idea. They, they are extremely impoverished, maybe like some of you guys feel. But what, is it, what does uh, 2 Corinthians 8 teach us about the Macedonians? Well, it tells us that they begged, they pleaded with Paul earnestly for the favor of being able to contribute to the ministry. Like literally, the Macedonians in these churches that are extremely impoverished, it says that they begged Paul for the favor. Like, like don't, don't take this away from us. It's something that we want to do. I don't care. Forget about the fact that we don't have enough. No, I know I've been commanded to be faithful with whatever I do have. And so, Paul, I am begging you, please let us give you this money so that we could support the advancement of the gospel. That was the Macedonians' approach and thought when they thought about giving to support. It wasn't, man, we, oh, I don't know. We don't really have enough to get by now. So, hey, Paul, Catch us, uh, catch us on your second trip through, and then we'll see if, we, if you know, any of us 
fell into some luck, we struck some gold, and then maybe we'll see if we can support. No, the Macedonians, even in the middle of their desperate impoverishment, they still begged Paul earnestly for the favor of being able to contribute. And uh, the third quick thought I have for you guys on that idea of uh, I'm a broke high school student, so how does this really apply to me? And maybe this is the most important for us to think about here this morning, is that the call to give is not strictly financial. The call for us to give to one another to support both one another here in this room and the church as a whole, yeah, the call to give is not a strictly financial one. See, your diligent work now can support your one another's, right? Like your diligent work to learn something new can be used to build stuff, right? We got a brother, we got a small group leader who's out of town. His own diligent work to to learn, Michael Jankowski's diligent work to learn how to work with his hands, like with woodworking and things like that, has blessed our church with like a cool pulpit that we can use every single weekend, right? Diligent work can benefit the church, not just in financial ways. And the way that you think about doing your duties, man, if you're doing those really faithfully, they can be used for the benefit of the church as a whole. You you know, I'm so tired. I'm so sad even when I hear, and I hear it even here in the United all the time. One student comes to another and says, oh, man, chemistry brutal. Man, I am struggling in this class, right? Maybe even saying like, I am failing chemistry, right? And almost every single time, if not every single time, I have heard that sentiment expressed by one of you guys. Oh, lit. Man, I just don't understand this book. What's it about? Uh, Writing essay, whatever it is, right? Almost every time I hear that, you you know what they're met with? Oh, man, yeah. I remember, I remember Kem, back to covalent bonds, right? No, I remember Kem, like that, yeah, that was brutal, man. Hey, stay tough, right? Uh, just got a couple weeks left to Kem. Good, good luck, man. Oh, yeah, that, that was brutal. Uh, I remember C6H1206. Yeah, that's, that's tough stuff. Uh, wh- why is that the case? Why is it the case that when a brother or sister comes to us struggling in something like a class that they have, why is it that they're so often met with just a commiseration? Were you, when you took that class, well, were you not working hard and diligent so that you could learn the subject material yourself? Is that why when somebody comes to you and says that they're struggling in a class like that, you're not able to help them because you weren't diligent yourself? Because you didn't take seriously the commands to work hard in all things and to do all things for the glory of the God, the glory of God? Were you not thinking that way when you were in chemistry? And so now when your brother or your sister is expressing how they're having a hard time in it, you're not able to help them because, well, you didn't really put in the work. You didn't really work diligently. Or maybe you did. Maybe you you crushed chemistry. You got that B. You got that A in chemistry. Awesome. Do you just not love them enough to really give up your time to try and help them think through something that's challenging? I mean, we have in this room plenty of people, plenty of one another's who can bear that burden, who, who can go out of their way to love one another because of the diligent work that they have done in their own lives. And the question is, why aren't we ready, why aren't we able, why aren't we willing to work hard on our own so that we can love one another? That is the command, that is the charge that Paul is given, and I want to make sure that we hear that and we know that well ourselves. You guys can work diligently in whatever you are doing, and that will impact the one another's that you guys have in this room. Diligent work at in and out working hard there will impact your ability to love one another here in this room. Diligent work in your literature class, in your uh, whatever, biology, whatever it is you're taking, if you take seriously the commands to love the brothers, to love the sisters, it will impact how you're able to love if you're diligent in those situations. Diligent work to get your permit, your license on time, that will impact your one another's. I, I mean, let, let me just take a second to pause there and to help you guys think through this because I hear so often, oh, well, getting my license, getting my permit on time, that just, that, that, that just impacts me, 
right? Like that's just whether or not I can get somewhere. That's just whether or not I need a ride, right? I mean, I I grew up coming to church and when I was a freshman and I was a sophomore in church, you know what happened? My parents, they didn't go to this church. They didn't go to church with me. And so every single time I wanted to go to church, I needed a ride. And so you know what I did my entire freshman and my entire sophomore year? I had all the phone numbers of all the juniors and seniors that were diligent to get their licenses on time. And I would text them every single week. Hey, bro, can you please give me a ride? I I would love a ride so that I can get to church there tonight. Every single week I had to do that. And then you know what happened when uh, as soon as I turned 15 and a half and I could get my permit, I thought, hey, there were so many faithful brothers and sisters at this church giving me a ride every single week. I'm gonna get my permit the day that I can so that I can get my license the day that I can so that as soon as I can drive other people, I can be ready, willing, and able to give other people a ride as they need, right? So, some people, they make it about money. They, they make it about this idea of, well, I can't afford a car anyways, so what's the point? Why get my license? Well, what if, you know, you get a job and then you get to that point and now you still don't have your license? How about you be faithful and diligent in what you can be faithful and diligent in? And as you do that, as you're faithful in that and God supplies every need, then when you're able to to, to have a car when you're able to then drive other people, then you can use it for the love of the brothers, for the love of the sisters. You see, thinking about brotherly love in this way, thinking about the way that we work in this way, is it really having an impact on one another? It's going to change the way that we do a lot of things. It's going to change the way that we show up to school on a Tuesday morning. It's going, to sh- it's going to change the way that we show up to our part-time job. It's going to change the way that we do our chores when we're at home uh, because we want to be diligent in what we have been tasked with so that we can love one another. Go back with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. I think you guys are still in Proverbs. So back to 1 Thessalonians 4. Because I want, to, I want to show you guys one more reason that Paul gives that we should aspire to work hard in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 12. Paul says they should aspire in brotherly love. They should aspire to work hard. Why? Verse 12. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul's command, Paul's charge, Paul's reason there in verse 12, what he's saying is that you guys, you need to conduct yourself in an elegant, in a beautiful and influential way. You you need to live, you need to be working in a way that when those around you see it, they are influenced by it because of its beauty, because of its obedience, Right, And you need to do that in a way before outsiders. Literally, that could be translated outside of those doors. Right, Paul is saying to work diligently. Why? So that your elegant work, so that the way that you go about it would be proper, would be commendable, would be influential to those that are not here right now, those who do not know Christ. You could put it down uh, for be there on your handout, your work and the lost. Your work and the lost. So again, I got to ask you guys, does the way that you work, let's just even zoom in at school now, does the way that you work at school cause those around you to have more respect for the non-school related things that you have to say and share? Are they more ready to listen to you share the gospel, right? The gospel that you claim to be saved by, to be radically changed by, are your classmates, are they more ready to listen to what you have to say because they know, they've seen for at least a whole school year now, they have seen your diligent work day in and day out? Or would they be put off knowing that you're the one scrambling last second as you're coming in to your Spanish class. Like, oh, I got to do, ah, I didn't do any of this homework. Shoot, like, let me, let me get it. It's multiple choice. Thank goodness. Like, let me circle all these, right? No. Is that the way that we're going about our work is last second? I mean, I, 
I know that's the case, right? I mean, just last night I'm talking about that and I saw a good number of, you know, little shoulder butts like, yeah, that's you walking into class, right? Uh, Would that put off the people that you're trying to share the gospel with, knowing that you're not diligent in your work, you're not taking things like this seriously? See, the way that you work is going to impact whether it's in your school, at your house, whether it's in your job, whatever it is, the way that you work and your diligence in doing so, that's going to impact the way that you're even able to share the gospel. Titus 2, 9 and 10, Paul, he's writing to Titus, but now he's talking specifically about bond servants, about slaves, about workers, those who have a job. And he's saying to Titus, he says, bond servants, They are to be submissive. They are to place themselves under their own masters. Right there, you could think about it as as students, you are to place yourselves under your teachers or workers, place yourself under your bosses, whatever it is. They are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn, they may make beautiful the doctrine of God our Savior. See, the way that you work under your teacher, the way that you work under your boss, it should make the gospel that you claim look beautiful. It should be like jewelry. It should be like a nice tux. It's not the substance. It's not the thing that saves. But man, it should dress up. It should take that gospel that you want to share and it shall make it look beautiful because it is clear, it is evident from start to finish that it has impacted the way that you live. Is that the way that you guys work? Is that the way that you guys go about your homework? And your schoolwork? Is that the way that you guys listen to your teachers? Is that the way that you guys show up to to the coffee shop you work at? Is that the way that you come home ready to do chores? Is that the way that you learn what you have to learn? Is that the way that you think about it? Is that me being diligent in this very thing isn't just going to impact the one and others here in this room, isn't just going to help build up the church, but man, I'm surrounded by non-Christians on almost a a regular, a non-stop basis, and when that's the case, they're looking They're taking note. I I mean, when you're at work, when I'm at work in my office, surrounded by a bunch of non-Christians, you know what stands out? Those who work diligently, who are not there complaining about the work that they have to do, but it really stands out those who are working diligently and they're trying to work hard and finish their tasks early, even so that they have the extra time so that they can help support those who need help in their work. Are you guys thinking about the way you work in this way. And I want to close with you guys, giving you guys a little update on the Thessalonian church. I mean, like I said, this letter to the Thessalonians, written about a year after Paul uh, plants the church there in Thessalonica. Well, let's go over to 2 Thessalonians now. Some time has passed. Paul, he's getting ready to write another letter here to the Thessalonians. And uh, this is what he writes to them. I don't think it needs much commentary. Let me read it for you. 2 Thessalonians 3, start with me in verse 6, please. Paul says, Now we command you to the same church, the same brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, in laziness, and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate, copy us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, doing as you should, but busy bodies, going house to house, wasting your time, stirring up strife. No, verse 12, now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ, do their work quietly, earn their own living 
As for you, brothers, those who are faithful in doing this, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, that they may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Some intense words there about work from the pen of Paul. And uh, guys, I I hope that you will take this seriously. Evidently, some of those people in the Thessalonian church, right, they got this letter from Paul, and, and for some reason they thought, all right, I don't need to work hard. We've already been faithful in it. I've done some good work. Now I'm just going to cruise. Certainly there are some who are faithful. Paul commends them. Paul encourages them to continue to press on, not to grow weary in doing good and their faithfulness to serve and support those that truly are in need. But what Paul says, right, is if you're not willing to work, this is to the church. This is in the church. Paul's saying to the church, hey, guys, if you're not willing to work, guess what? We're like going to cut you off. You're not working diligently. That's why you don't have what you need because you're not being faithful in what the Lord has commanded you to do. Uh, Again, I want to charge you guys that we would start thinking of brotherly love and we would start thinking of our diligence and our day-to-day lives and that we would begin to connect these two ideas. That Man, I'm going to be faithful here this Tuesday morning in my chemistry class because if I'm diligent to do this, the Lord is going to bless me with all that I need. And if I'm diligent to do this, I'm going to be able to love my brothers. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next year, but I know if I'm faithful to be diligent in my work on on a regular basis, God will use it to bless my brothers and sisters around me. Let's pray. Lord, your word is so clear from start to finish. You are unchanging. God, you put us here on this earth. You put man here so that we would work so that we would tend to your creation. Lord, work is not a result of sin. No, it is what you put us here and you made us to do. And Lord, you have given us one another. You have blessed us with with brothers and with sisters here in the church. And, And while I think all of us would say, we would claim, yeah, we love one another. Yeah, we love the person sitting to our left and the person sitting to our right. Lord, I ask that the way that we live on a regular basis, even when those one another's are not physically right by our side, I ask that the way that we would live and go about our lives, God, that that would give evidence to the fact that we really do love one another, that we would be ready and willing to place, to outdo, to like race to the bottom so that we could prefer, so that we could exalt those who are around us, put their needs above our own. And I pray specifically that the the United High School Ministry would be known as a radical group of high schoolers who take their work very seriously because they see their work as a way to give you glory and be obedient to what you have called us to do. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. It has been great opening the word with you guys here this weekend. Small groups are back this Thursday. Thank you guys for coming. Love you guys.